Hey guys, and welcome to a little walkthrough of our super simple 200 series Land Cruiser build. We're full timing in this truck now for about seven months. We've put 25,000 miles on it already, most of which is off-road since that's what we do for a living yep. and for fun. And we haven't cleaned it at all. So this is exactly how we use it. We didn't even make it look pretty. It has a crack in the windshield that we got yeah. literally yesterday. Um, so this is as it sits, how we've been living out of it. So if you wanna see a minimalist 200 series build, come along and we'll show you ours. Hey there, I'm Kelsey, that's Tim, and this is the story of our adventure. Life is fleeting, and we want to squeeze every bit out of it. We are wandering the world, so home is a bit of a moving target for us. We love finding the random, the remote, and sharing it all with you. So subscribe to get lost with us, and hopefully find some inspiration to go after your own dreams. Okay guys, I'm gonna take you around the outside of the truck and show you suspension, sort of externals, and Kelsey's gonna show you the inside, so why don't we go on with that? Cool. Okay, so first things first, our simple sort of pre-runner style bumper. I'm kind of calling them front and rear sliders on the truck. On the front, we just picked a point that we thought would be good. There's so little overhang. We really have not been dragging or hitting this on almost anything. It's rare when we do. So those two big horns that I built that connect to the frame down there, uh, have been really good to act like skid plates. I've considered putting a skid plate in between the two horns, but it just works so good. It's so clean looking. Uh, it needs a fresh paint job after bashing through stuff for the last several months of work, but otherwise it's been working really, really well. So I'm very happy with these bumpers. We haven't missed having a winch. We've been stuck in some lake mud one time, but there's really nothing to winch off of besides burying something at that point. So we've been pretty happy. I think if we were to travel internationally in this truck, I would absolutely add a winch. But if you watch our review on sort of the 80 series versus the 200, I'll tell you why I wouldn't take this truck uh, around the globe anyways. Not that you couldn't. So really happy with these super simple bumpers. They're very lightweight and they've given us the ground clearance, which is the main purpose for them. Uh, let me go ahead and talk about the suspension next. So we have the Total Chaos Fabrication Upper A-Arm. I'm a big fan of Total Chaos. Back in the day, I had a Tacoma back 20 years ago that had their long travel system and uh, it was an amazing truck and their stuff is just super high quality. So I knew that there was gonna be no worries with it. Um, so that actually added quite a bit of driving feel to the truck. A lot of trucks, you don't absolutely have to have an upper A-arm. On this truck, I noticed an immense difference. Not only were we able to align it properly, uh, but it also felt like the suspension moved a lot more easily. We're using Dobinson's coilovers, just their IMS series, sort of their middle grade. We didn't want to go for anything fancy on this truck because it's a working truck. And although I tend to drive fairly quickly off-road, I didn't want to invest $5,000 in some fancy shocks uh, that most of the time we're in low range, crawling over trails and doing the work that we do. And even when we're traveling, since it's our home, we're not really catching air and flying along like we would have in some previous trucks. Uh, that's been fantastic. The wheels. I love these wheels because of the lightest wheels I could find. They're the Rock Warriors. I am not a fan of the fake beadlocks. They call them rock rings or rock protectors. But really all they do, if you look at these up close, is catch a bunch of sand and dirt. And then as they vibrate, they etch the wheel. So these nicely forged wheels have tons of marks and scratches from the rock ring that was bolted on here. So to me, that's just a fake beadlock ring and it's extra weight, it's almost a pound per wheel. So we're happy that we removed those. And Kelsey actually found some basic uh, metal paint that we used and it's sort of a dark bronze. I'm in awe of how good this is held up. We've done Plasti Dip on previous wheels, powder coat and wheel paint. And I would say the wheel paint or this general metal paint from Home Depot has actually held up better than anything else. It doesn't seem to have that many rock chips. And considering how much off-road we do, I'm pretty surprised. Uh, KO2 tires, these are 285, 75, 17s. So they're about a 34 by 11 or something like that. They're fantastic. We've been very happy with them. Almost no chunking despite being off-road every day. We're not always airing down. We, we tend to air down Sunday and air up on Friday at the end of the work week when we're working. But when like today, we're just gonna go and do a trail to get to a campsite or maybe go check something out. I don't always bother, bother to air down, which can chunk out some tires because they're not deflecting over sharp rocks. They're sort of staying rigid and that can cause some chunking but we've been really happy. The KO2s have done a really good job, in my opinion, of resisting all that chunking. Uh, they are wearing down fairly quickly because we're doing so much off-road. When we're mapping 
and doing that work and then all the travel for, for fun in between the work, uh, a year out of a set of tires for us is sort of the maximum that we can get. So it's, it's not your normal uh, turn time on tires. I think that sort of summarizes it for, for this area of the truck. Why don't I go ahead and show you the sliders and the rear bumper. So on this part of the truck, you can see the wire going up to the Starlink. We do a whole video about that, so check that out, but we've been very happy with that. The fact that I can upload this video right when we're done editing it from the middle of nowhere is pretty amazing. Uh, you can see here we have some basic rock sliders. I didn't do kickouts on these because we're really not rock crawling with this truck. I just did a straight tube slider. One, it hides some of the ugly pinch welds down there, and two, at least it's the first point that we're gonna hit. We've only hit on these once, because again, we're trying not to do rock crawling, but sometimes with the work we do, we end up on a trail that's more for a truck on 35s, and we have hit them, and I'm glad that we have that. If I could change anything, I might have stepped them out another three or four inches, just so when people are door dinging us in parking lots, it'll hit that first, and additionally, it'll help also off-road. We could turn the truck on them a little bit more. Uh, but that's sort of a light duty slider, I would say. It's, it's heavy DOM tubing that actually was some tubing for a race car that my buddy had that wouldn't work on that race car. So it's very strong. It's just not, not quite as off-road purposed as some with kickouts or a further outer step to protect the body panels of the truck. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention on the front is these saw function caps. I absolutely love caps like this that you can't lose. They're just super nice to have. We'll put links for everything that's purchasable that we didn't build in the uh, description below, but I absolutely love these caps. If you off-road long enough and you put your caps on top of the tire when you're, when you're airing down, eventually you'll drive away and you'll just keep losing them over time. So I really like that we have these. Um, moving back to the slider. This is sort of what started us trimming on this truck. Uh, it was such a clean one owner, sort of perfect paint 200 series when we bought it that I don't know if I would have had the, the guts to cut the rear bumper or the front bumper um, if we hadn't already dented it up. You can see back in here, we really caved this whole bumper in, which hangs like down to here. And with that massive chunk taken out of it, I knew there's no way we can do what we do for work or for fun without making some modifications to these bumpers. Now, we had a company offer us a front and rear bumper, but looking at the weights of them and the size of them, it just didn't seem logical to me for how we're using this truck. Maybe full-time living in it down in a, a different country where we're trying to winch through stuff similar like we did with Goose, I'd consider it, but I still am not sure if I would because it's such a huge weight gain to your vehicle. I'm just not a big fan of the modern trucks. You have to take so much plastic away and that's always replaced with a lot of steel that uh, it just wasn't a way I wanted to go. So that's why we decided to build everything on this truck. Um, you can see, unfortunately, I caved it just above where I was cutting. If we went any higher, I'd have to get rid of the parking sensors. And I wanted to just leave that part as stock as possible. But it, you know, possibly at some point in the future, we could trim this a little bit higher. This is the one we hit the most. There's such a large overhang from the rear tire to the back of the truck that we do drag on this and it's held up perfectly. So it's got side supports, and then four center supports uh, tying into the trailer hitch in the back there. And so it, it's got a lot of strength. You could actually jack the truck, the corner of the truck up on this. It flexes a little, it'll touch this bumper and hit it a little. So it's not so solid that it's not moving, but it's solid enough to take that hit when we come off of a step and not hurt anything sort of more important. So it's worked really, really well for us. We often drag on this. Again, that's kind of why I call it a rear slider instead of a bumper but it's been great for us. And it lets us still have our integrated uh, tow hitch. So we can use that as a recovery point if we want. I don't, I would trust to pull on this tube because it is heavy DOM tubing, but if it was to move like the whole truck sideways, I'd rather use the uh, trailer hitch in back. And we have a Factor 55 thimble and soft shackle we would put in that if we were getting recovered from the rear, or if we were towing somebody out, again, we would just use the trailer hitch. So one reason we cut this here is obviously because we wanted to retain the parking sensors. The other reason is because we've kept our spare tire underneath. As soon as you move your spare tire, it's gotta come inside with you or you have to build a big swing out rear bumper. And it's just another level of truck build that I didn't wanna to go to. I wanted to keep this truck looking and acting a little more stock than a sort of heavier overland build. So we chose to cut it here, one, because of the parking sensors, and two, our spare tire sits down here. So at some point you're trimming up the sides but your spare tire or your hitch is still gonna be the lowest thing in the rear. Um, you can see on the rear bumper that we went ahead and put this center tube, and that center tube is to hang down a little bit lower than the spare tire and be the first thing that you're gonna hit. Now, it's possible that a sharp rock that has a point to it could puncture the sidewall of the spare tire and give you a flat, but this has worked really well to take the primary abuse on the back end of the truck. 
Uh, additionally, you can see there's a little bit of rust coming down. We've been up in Montana and Idaho with immense amounts of rain. And so I do need to do a better job of tucking this back and give the whole thing a, a paint job. We did use steel it. It's very expensive, but they have steel it in black as well as steel it in gray. And it's a stainless steel paint. We found it to be really, really strong, almost like a powder coat. We use it on all the Baja race cars that we have and it's just really nice and if, if a rock hits it or if you scrape it like this it doesn't flake off the paint it'll simply rub and eventually it will rub through down to the metal but it doesn't have a tendency to do any flaking so if you scrape a point it is literally just that point that gets scraped off and everything near it is still just as protected so i really like that additionally it works well to weld over it so when we first were building this bumper i was able to paint the whole bumper and then when i added this tube a little bit later and some additional supports Again, you can just weld right through steel it because it's got enough metal content in it, I guess, to not mess with uh, weld. So again, a little bit of rust on there just because we've been up in some wet areas, but that pretty much ties through the outside of the truck. One last thing I wanna to talk to you about is our engine transmission setup and any modifications we made there. Okay, as far as the drivetrain of the truck, it's completely stock. We haven't re-geared the truck. This engine is, to me, a gem. I absolutely love it. We get immensely better mileage than our 80 series, and yet we have double the power, essentially, 400 horsepower. The one thing I really dislike about this engine setup is the airbox. Some previous Land Cruisers, or most previous Land Cruisers, had a cyclonic air filtration system. Uh, they call it the tuna can down on the bottom. That would accumulate sediment, and then you could dump it out, and it would sort of pre-clean the air. Now, eventually, on all the trucks we've traveled in, we have gone with a snorkel with a pre-cleaner, and that also helps immensely. When we were chasing the Sonora Rally down in Mexico, we were running race course miles after all the race cars had come through. And so our race cars had come through. And so it was like deep silt, silt that was coming over the hood of the truck. I could have changed the air filter half day on those days. Instead, we changed it every couple of days, but you would pound it out and you'd have a quarter inch of silt on the ground. So really not good in my opinion. It is drawing air from this fender well. So in silt beds, you're throwing silt right into where it's picking it up. There are some aftermarket alternatives besides going to a snorkel. Donaldson makes one for the diesel Land Cruisers in Australia. And although they say it doesn't fit this truck, there are some people who have fitted it. So that would be tempting, but it's nearly $1,000. Now it's an air filter that is literally designed to take you know, entire bottles of talcum powder type dirt. And in the tests, they'll show emptying bottles of talcum powder literally into the air box and the air filter is still working perfectly. That's an option, but at $1,000, I did the math, that's a whole lot of air filters that I could go through. So we just carry two extra air filters in our drawer system, and I would say we've already gone through 30 air filters. And each one I'm pounding out and is leaving a pile of dirt. So that's the only thing I don't like about this truck, but air filters are pretty cheap, and you can get them just about anywhere, and Toyota is good about keeping them in stock because this engine's used in so many vehicles from the early 2000s uh, that it hasn't been an issue. But that's my main gripe about this truck. Otherwise, it's completely stock. We've changed every single fluid in it, and that's really all we've done. We have the anti-gravity starting battery that's got a low voltage disconnect that'll protect us. We've got two wires going back to the National Little Power Pack that, that Kelsey will show you. That's been immense amount of power for us, and we drive so much, there's been no need for solar. Certainly, if we were traveling more leisurely and hanging out in a place for five days in a row, 10 days in a row, I would add solar to this truck. We're moving so much that there's just been no need for it because this system will put 25 amps when the engine's running into our 120 amp hour lithium battery, the house battery, and that's been more than enough. So I have to say this engine is truly amazing. The idea that we can get 18.5 miles per gallon, that's sort of been my best tank. Um, full tank though, not just part of a tank, but really a full tank of fuel on pavement, trying to get good mileage, definitely hypermiling it in essence, but doing 70 to 75 miles per hour on cruise control, taking it easy on the hills, accelerating on the downhills and sort of trying to get good mileage. I was able to get 18.5. Our normal on this truck on pavement is in the 16s, which in Goose, our 80 series Land Cruiser with a straight six that had half the horsepower, 16 was the absolute best I was ever able to achieve. And that's before we did the pop top when it was a little more stock like this truck and I could get it occasionally, but very, very rarely. This truck at 16 miles per gallon, I'm often driving 80, 85 miles an hour, passing people using the power that's available. And then off-road, it can be all over the place. We've gotten nine, 10, 12, 14 miles per gallon off-road. It just depends if we're doing sort of graded dirt road driving or like the trail we took down here, first, second gear, low range. Um, but 
very happy with this engine, have had no issues with it. Uh, it's still mind boggling to me that it uses zero W20. That seems like such a light oil. But uh, of course we've been sticking with that since that's the specs and it's been absolutely fantastic. Burns no oil. And like I said, we've just changed out all the fluids, brake fluid, coolant, oil changes frequently. We drain and refill the transmission. We drain and refill the front differential, rear differential, transfer case. And that's really it. This truck has been so problem free to be at 175,000 miles, we bought it with 150,000 miles. I'm in awe, I love this thing. So um, whatever people say about this engine, I know that in some people's opinion, it gets bad miles per gallon. I think it can, if you build it like a normal Overlander, lots of stuff on the roof. This engine and this truck is already so big and shaped like a brick that if you make it less aerodynamic and you weigh it up, it absolutely gets horrible mileage. But for us, it's been so much better mileage than we're used to in a gasoline 80 series that it's not a big deal. Now, is it anywhere near the mileage of our diesel 80 series that we had? No, the diesel was usually in the 20s if we weren't hammering it. But this truck is doing 85 miles an hour up a steep grade up in Colorado mountains with no issues. And our diesel truck was doing about 50 miles an hour up those hills. So it is quite a different beast, but I gotta say I'm really, really happy with this truck. So, okay, that's enough of talking about the outside of the truck and the modifications we've made. Kelsey's gonna show you the part that we've probably shown less on camera, which is the inside. All right, so the inside will start up here in the driver's seat. And like the outside, we wanted to try and keep this vehicle pretty stock. So I'll show you some of the things that are additional up here and then just kind of show you around. So, uh, couple things that I like right here are this truck is a 2008 and it does not have Bluetooth through the stereo so we added this little Bluetooth dongle thing that plugs into the auxiliary port and that just allows us to play our podcast music from our phones without wires or anything like that we use it pretty much only <laughs> so we are always listening to uh, music or podcasts through the Bluetooth, which has been awesome. So that's a big change. And then this little leveling guy from Solve Function again is just really handy to have. We use it every night when we go camping. And I don't know if you can see on the camera, but there's a little bubble in there and it just tells you where you're at. So that has been just really useful. Little, little tiny thing that's useful. Um, we added a little like security camera from Garmin and nice to have for accidents, theft, just a, a nice little backup there. Um, seat covers, you can see we have covers on the seats and on the center console. And if you remember when we got this truck, that was one of the worst things about it was the seats were just kind of thrashed. So this, uh, after some research, was what we picked. And it is equipped, from equipped, but it is escape gear. And they have held up really well. They have not been washed or anything. So this is just everyday use in the dust and the dirt and sweat and <laughs> mud and all that. So they have held up really, really well. Um, they're really comfortable. So those have been great. Um, and then as for just kind of the stock features in this truck, you have some steering wheel uh, buttons, which is, you know, nice. I like the little features like this where you can pull this out, it adjusts, but you also have that little guy there. Um, one thing that Tim did do throughout the truck actually is change out the lights to be LED. So these ones are actually red. The ones in the back are bright white, but that's just kind of nice uh, if you're driving at night to be able to see. Obviously there's a big sunroof, moonroof, which is nice to have. Uh, by the way, it is about uh, over 100 degrees. It's supposed to be 108 today, so I apologize for sweating, but it is very hot today. So we're doing this in the heat because we just wanted to show you guys. But uh, down here, we have our little ham radio. So you can see underneath the seat is where it's mounted. And then we have our little uh, handheld mic up here. And we use that when we're doing like Baja races, that sort of thing. If we're traveling with a group of people, we can talk to each other. Um, this actually is a little cooler in here, which is nice. The AC has to be on, but it does work really well. So we'll often put like waters in there and they're nice and cold that's easy to grab instead of right behind me is actually our fridge and speaking of right behind me let's move to the back all right moving to the driver's rear seat we have our fridge it is a dometic 35 liter um, which is fairly small but it actually holds everything that we need we can probably go for maybe two weeks at most if we pack really carefully and you know you take a drink out put a drink in kind of a thing 
It's actually the same size as what we had in our two previous trucks, Goose and even the Maltec. So uh, it's a really good size fridge. It also worked because as you'll see, the sleeping platform is above it, so it was a good height. Um, and it attaches to your phone for Bluetooth, which is really handy to be able to check on it. Um, like Tim mentioned, we have this wire running up. That's our Starlink. So it just comes back here. I'll show you where that's all hooked up. Um, we have some recovery gear just kind of in between the seat and the fridge back there. A nice little cubby to hold stuff like that. So right now we have a scepter can in here. So that's five extra gallons. We can set another one in there, but right now we just have one. So five or 10 extra gallons, depending on what you need. Um, and then in here, we also have uh, just little plastic bins that happen to be the right height, but that's where I store food. If we have, you know, like extra cans, that sort of thing that doesn't fit in the fridge, that just goes in there and it's a nice, safe, secure place where it's not gonna roll around to store it. Um, and then one other thing, just down in the door, we have our little uh, nets for the windows. So when we go to bed, we just throw these over the windows, roll the windows down, get a nice cool breeze going. And I have to say, for a super cheap Amazon thing, they're kind of amazing. Those were on Goose, so those little window nets have gone through many countries and many years, and they're a cheapo. They're not some name brand. We didn't buy good ones. It was just, hey, let's see if those work. Back in the day after we met and we had Goose and we slept inside, kind of like this truck, you want more airflow, and, now and they're still alive. The elastic's dying, but we'll put a link for those. Yeah. You would think they were some quality part, but they were some generic uh, Amazon one. Yeah, they're awesome. So yeah, we use those every single night. Moving towards the back. So back here is where we do most of our living. We cook back here, we hang out back here. I love having a tailgate. The 200 series uh, has that tailgate, which is key. Um, back here, we have a Dobinson's drawer system, which we just got actually secondhand and it has worked really well, held up really good. Um, we have on top of that, actually just a cheapo mattress from Amazon that we've had for a long time and it happened to work and it's really comfortable. Technically, we could probably get it a little wider uh, if we were to get a bigger mattress and cut it down to fit precisely, but we find this really comfortable and it is actually quite a bit bigger than either beds in uh, the Maltec that we had and way bigger than Goose in the Camp Tech Pop Top. So this is a very comfortable, luxurious bed, um, despite that it may look small to some of you, it is not, it's actually, I think just a little less than a queen actually, so it's pretty big. Um, normally, about the only thing that I took out of the truck right now because I'm washing it is our sheets. So we have two pillows that go back here and like a comforter over it and we have two warmer blankets if we need them. And that just stores back here on top of the bed nice and flat and clean, the bed's all made. And we have our clothing bags, both clothing bags. Tim has one, I have one. And I'll show you where those go in just a minute when we crawl in to go to sleep. Underneath here, this has little side pockets, which is handy. So I just keep random stuff. There's hats in there. And then our Starlink router actually lives towards the front, which is harder to access, but we've had no problems with it being hot or anything like that. It just lives under there safely and uh, it connects and everything. So that's a pretty awesome place to keep that. And the Starlink from the truck, you can be probably 56, 50 or 60 feet away from it and still get access to it. We've been in like a hotel room and you realize that you're still picking up the signal from the Starlink inside the hotel uh, if the car's parked close enough, which is kind of funny. Um, underneath the mattress, I just keep anything that's flat. Like I have a cutting board and some plates, flip flops. You won't really feel any of that underneath the mattress. So it works out well. In this side, we have uh, cooking stuff. So we have stuff to make coffee, we have pans, we have our little partner steel stove, which I love. Um, again, I'll link to that kind of stuff. Uh, Non-stick pan, just everything you need to cook. And knife, yeah. So cooking stuff all contained in here. Um, in this side, we have tools. It's a little bit messy at the moment, but we have tools, we have jacks, we have water filter. We have gloves, just basically this is the garage. This is our garage in here. We have coveralls and all that kind of stuff. Spare air filters under there, nothing too exciting. Um, let me show you where I put the bags. So if I grab our clothing bags. I just get set up there and you're ready for bed. And then it's easy enough to crawl right in. One other thing that is key about sleeping inside this truck, and we noticed it after we got it, is when you close it, 
you can't get out. So we, Tim put in a button that you'll see up there so that you can just push that and you're able to get in and out easily from back here. And that is thanks to Cruiser Outfitters. Thank you, Kurt. He has a 200 series and I think he noticed that like in the 80 and other Land Cruisers, of course, they have an inside handle and a, a, a latch release. This didn't. So he put this little kit together. We'll put a link for that below as well. But this is super nice. So when it's cold, we're actually shutting this. Yep in bear country or whatever, and we can get up in the middle of the night and get out to go to the restroom or whatever. Um, of course, in hotter temps, we're leaving this open and we're using... Oh yeah, I'll show you. We have, underneath the mattress again, we have this little guy. And I just sewed this up from a company, I think it's called Mosquito Netting or something. I'll put the link below where you can just buy kind of raw netting. And I just put little magnets in there. Again, on Amazon little uh, rare earth magnets, so they're super strong. And that just hooks on all the way around, and you've got a nice mosquito-free sleeping area. Um, I mentioned this fan in one of our favorite gear videos, so we just hang it up there. It attaches to our National Luna Power Pack and uh, just can run all night, all day, whatever, if you want. Uh, up here you can see we have our radio antenna, which when we're not using it lives in there so it's not banging on all the trees. All right, and that does it for this section. I'll show you the passenger rear door, and I think that'll be it. All right, and back here, we have, again, our other side uh, net for that door. Back here, we have the National Luna Power Pack, which has our anti-gravity 120 amp hour deep cycle battery in there. And as you can see, stuff is plugged in. We have our fridge running off of this all the time, and then our inverter, which runs our Starlink right now until we do the 12 volt conversion with that. Uh, that thing has been amazing. It literally runs everything back here. So without that, we couldn't do all the video stuff, the editing. It's, it's really pretty vital. And this has run actually for six days. We left uh, to learn how to sail actually. And it was in here for six or seven days running the fridge in pretty hot weather. Um, so that, that's pretty amazing. It can run that long without repowering. We don't have solar or anything like that. Um, it does really well in the heat. It does really well in the cold. Uh, we have had no issues with it. And it really is just awesome, a lifesaver. Underneath, Again, just more storage. I've used plastic bins at the right height and they've held up really well. They create a ton of storage down here. We have our little grill, which we love to use. You've probably seen that before. Uh, little table lives here. Our tripod actually lives under here. It's in use right now. Um, our chairs live under here. And if for some reason we need extra space, if we have a lot of food or something, I'll just throw those on top of the bed. Uh, easy. This is our, pull it out our water bag and right now it's empty but this holds five gallons of water and so it just sits in here and you can fill water bottles right here which is really nice we also have a front runner bag that if we need another five gallons of water if we're going further we have that in there as well it's just not as easy to get out right away so we'll usually use that to store the water and then put it in here when we want to access it um, this is our computers so we have a bunch of camera gear and just electronics in here that we want to be safe we have a lot of stuff so that we can film all these videos for you and capture our travels and that's where all that lives underneath that we have max tracks which is actually a really good place for it we don't get to them that often and when we do they come out i have really big bag like trash bags and so when they're muddy they then go into the trash bags and sit on top of the bed until we can clean them off and restore them back under there. But that has worked really well. Fire extinguisher. Um, we have more escape gear, a little seat back organizer, which just holds a bunch of random little stuff, sunscreens, all that kind of stuff, bug spray. And that pretty much does it for the interior of the truck. I hope you enjoyed that little tour. <laughs> Cool, thank you. Yeah, it is quite warm. We have had the cameras overheating and we are clearly overheating. Absolutely. Today. <laughs> so. Well, we want to give you a little summary on this truck yes. and try and answer some of the questions we've had. One question is how long will you go in this setup between getting an Airbnb, a hotel, paying for a campsite? For us, when we're working, we have this great benefit of on the weekend, the company will pay for a hotel. So yep. each weekend, especially when we've been doing the hiking work, we've hiked over a hundred <laughs> miles. And so you're filthy at the end of each week. And so we get a hotel, use the washing machines, get showers, et cetera. So just doing six days in the truck really in those stints. When we're traveling for fun, uh, three weeks, something like that, yeah. you know, I, I'd say with any truck, even the Maltec, somewhere at a month, 
without leaving the truck, without paying for a campsite, just buying supplies when needed, yep. filling up the water tank when needed. At some point in a month, you if you're in a hot environment or a humid environment, you want a real shower, not just the truck shower. Yeah. So it was about a month anyways. I think the longest we've ever done without ever stopping or being in a city or yep. anything like that, it's probably two months in a really dry environment mm -hmm. in Goose, our previous uh, 80 series. I would do the same time in this, but yeah, somewhere around there, you're hoping for a river or something to jump into. Totally. So for us, this is easily a two week truck. Mm -hmm. We can even bring food and water for two weeks. We fill up the other water tank, but that's about the max. And what we found in the world is the world's not as remote as we thought it would be as we're traveling around. And there's many more places to buy water. Every human needs food, every human needs water. So unless you're in the Atacama Desert or something like that, that was where we did probably a month and a half to two months. Yeah. Uh, because it was truly remote. The rest of the world, you're popping through little villages, and so you can resupply, pay for a shower or something. Uh, for us, that's the only reason we'd ever go to a campground is to use some sort of facility like a shower or a washing machine. Totally. Otherwise, we'd much rather never spend money to camp. Certainly, yeah. we see people in Baja, like World Overlanders, staying at paid campgrounds. We'd rather not pay for three weeks in a row per night and then spend, you know, 50 bucks on an Airbnb for a night that's really nice and enjoy that. So for us, that's kind of how long this truck is good for. And then why not pop top it? Why not put bumpers and, and, and drop down tables and all that? Two reasons. One, this weight? truck yeah. is a, <laughs> well, definitely weight. This truck is an interim truck for us. So we have been home only nine months from Turkey. I know it seems like we've done a lot in that time and we have, we've been going, 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 trying to make money. But it's a, it's a truck for while we're home to go to Mexico and Canada, basically. Mm -hmm. We could go down to Central America maybe in it. But it's not my idyllic truck for traveling the world. I would prefer a nice and slow, simple 70 mm -hmm. series, troopy, something like that. I don't even know if I'd pop top it, to be honest. No. Every pop top we've had, it, it, you know, leaks and, and, and yeah. you hear music and you hear you, you have smoky air coming in and from campsites. I would and, say, honestly, like if I were not traveling the world and I just wanted a truck, to do what we used to do while yep. we had jobs, you know, maybe going a week or two camping, you're usually going to have nice weather. You yeah. want to be outside. You want to sit by the campfire. This is my ideal truck for that, actually. Yeah, it's it, it really for us after all the complex trucks that I had complex systems and all these sort of aftermarket modifications that none frankly are as good mm -hmm. as Toyota. Toyota engineers are going to do things just better. Nothing against the setups that we've had. They've all been really good. It's just they're not as good as a factory truck that has no cuts in it, right? Yes. And so for us, this is just sort of the idyllic setup for a keep it simple, stupid setup. Sleeping inside a to truck. To live in it yeah. full time and know there's not a date that we're ending, then it gets tougher because you go, oh geez, this isn't a lot of room. This isn't yeah. a lot of personal space for, for, those of, for each of us, you know. Yep. In Goose, I could be sleeping up top and she could be down below, you know, reading a book. In the Maltec, much more easy to do that mm -hmm. sort of setup where you have real space to, to, to sort of spread out, work on your laptop. This isn't that. But for a yeah, week-long, two-week-long trip, which is... This is one of the most comfortable beds, I'd yeah. say. Before we cut uh, the roof off of Goose, we had basically the same setup. Yep. And it, it has proved to be my favorite. In Goose, it was my favorite. Yep. In this, it's my favorite. You have a really comfortable bed. Yep. If it's loud, if it's cold, you can be Sort in of cocoon there. in. Yeah. yeah. When you shut it all, it, it is completely silent. You can park in the middle of a national park parking lot and no one knows you're camping in your truck. You can park at the top of a snowy mountain and, and sort of uh, close it all I'm up and it's sure very stealthy. It's still yeah. going because I don't see a red light, so I'm a little concerned. So in general, we're really happy with it. Like I mentioned, yeah. I was talking about the engine. It gets astoundingly good mileage for what the perception of this truck is. Uh, even Dan Greck commented when we bought this truck, he goes, Isn't the, doesn't that get horrible mileage? How's that gonna work for you guys? Well, the truck we took through Central and South America got immensely worse mileage than this. So it is all relative. Why wouldn't I take this truck around the world? Well, I don't need 400 horsepower, so it's, it's, it's useless to me. Yeah. I don't need a modern truck. The modernity of this truck doesn't add anything to it for me. It may have more issues. I've had no issues with it. We've been through the sloppiest, nastiest mud for days on end. Everything has been soaked inside and outside of this truck and we've had no electrical issues. But would this truck possibly have more electrical issues than a 70 series? Yeah, has to have more. There's just more electronics. Yep. Does the KDSS and the um, A-Track system work really well? Those are, KDSS is the hydraulic suspension system and being hydraulic, there's not much to break. Uh, but is it more complex than not having it? Yeah. Is it 
really nice though when you're doing a freeway off ramp and you realize you're going way too fast mm -hmm. and the truck corners a lot more like a sports car than it does an SUV yes. that's massive. It's awesome. Yeah. Do I need it traveling the world when I'm going to go slowly and carefully because I'm in developing countries on roads that have potholes the size of this truck? I don't need it. Uh, a track, it works fantastic. And if it breaks, I'm going to go and find the parts to fix it, take it to a dealer, whatever. When I'm in El Salvador, it's going to be really hard to have someone diagnose a track. Uh, you know, again, that may not be the best example. There are a lot of Toyotas there, but we did find that even in these Toyota heavy countries, there's not people who know the electronic side of things. Mm -hmm. They're and used to. It can be hard to get parts. Yeah, even you know, Argentina. Right at a Toyota dealer. I yeah. think I've said this before. I wanted cap, rotor, spark plugs, air filter. They had the air filter. And everything else they said 60 to 90 days argentina a very modern country in buenos aires the biggest city in the country and it was 60 to 90 days get parts for our 80 series so i went never mind so you can get them you'll find them yep. but to me the 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 lack of complexity of a different truck would 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 tip me to that direction yep. now have people traveled in 200 series yes you can find them online i don't remember the names of their accounts but there's a couple that did the pan american went to the loop of australia may even have gone to uh, uh, africa and they were able to do it i know they had some troubles here and there that's how i saw them is on the forums or the land cruiser mm -hmm. pages asking about how do i get this how do i yeah. get that but would i take this truck i could but I just, I just wouldn't. It is so perfect for the United States though. If you have an 80 series, believe me, I love them. I think they're, they're yeah. the top of sort of the high watermark of Toyota. The problem is they're all 25 to 30 years old. And just like any truck, if it's been perfectly maintained for 25 years, an 80 series is still a great truck. If it's gotten rusty and because they're so reliable, people just wait until things break. That means that all kinds of things I won't go into are going to be screwed up in the axles, the transmission, the transfer case. If people haven't been actively uh, maintaining them before they break, an 80 series can be a nightmare. So I know a lot of people have bought 80 series because of us and others traveling in them. And I, I think that's great. But then some of the messages are, man, I bought one and it had nothing but problems. <laughs> And if you neglect a truck for 30 years, it's going to be a nightmare. So just had a lot of maintenance done to them. So. Yeah, we, we were always on top of that, yep. you know. And so with this truck, though, you're buying something that is the same age as when I bought Goose. Yeah, this, this is, is a 15-year-old truck, truck, and Goose was 15 years old when I bought him. That's still well within the service life of a Toyota Land Cruiser, as long as you're doing basic maintenance. Yeah. And so we've had zero issues, like as in none, and I don't expect any. I think this truck will be great for another eight years, and yeah. at that point... It'll be really old, it'll be 25 years old, and then I expect unless someone's been on top of it, you'll have issues. Yeah. So for us, it's sort of resetting the clock on that, that Toyota quality. We're not yep. buying new. I don't want to take a $100,000 truck, which is what this is new, or was you know when it was mm -hmm. new, about 90 probably, but after tax and everything else, you're yeah. basically in a hundred grand. These trucks are now 20 to 25 grand. This was 24,500, I think. Yeah. And I mean, that is so cheap for a no rust, one owner in California, all service records, 200 series, that it kind of tips the scales for the US to get this truck over an 80 for me. Yep. If you're going to Moab, if you are wheeling hard, you're doing the Rubicon 80 series all the way. Yep. Could you get a 200 through? I'm sure there's guys who have, and I'm sure you could. It's wide, it's big. Um, for that kind of stuff, I wouldn't do it. Now, I'll still take this to Moab and do 80% of the trails. Uh, you know, fins and things and, and, and go out to Merrimack and monitor and go around. All the stuff we do in the military training, I would take this truck. Yeah. And it would do great. All the Baja stuff. You know, I'd go up and over Simpson Hill and up to Mike's, uh, past Mike Sky Ranch over the pass. All of that, which is like light rock crawling, I'd call. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Anything more, I, I feel like you're just taking the wrong thing to, uh, uh, taking a knife to a gunfight. I had a third gen 4Runner and I kept building it and building it and building it and put front and rear lockers in it and I built bumpers and sliders and then better sliders. I was trying to build a rock crawler out of an IFS truck that's so good at other things, I made it bad at everything and mediocre at rock crawling. So yeah. not that you can't turn these and other trucks into what you want. I would just say this truck is the perfect USA truck because yeah. you can do 85, 90 miles an hour down the freeway to that really far off wheeling space, do the wheeling, yeah. almost all of it. Uh, and unless you're literally into rock crawling, I, I don't see the need to get something else no. in, in my opinion. Not that the GX 470s and the smaller versions of these can't do all that too. I just mean in the Land Cruiser space, uh, man, these are looking like a better and better value. And they're the last V8 you're gonna be able to get in a Land Cruiser. So to me, 
It's yeah. a neat truck. I think we're already, I'm looking at it as a pretty simplistic truck. Yeah. And I think others yeah. are too, because you're realizing it's not a twin turbo. It's not, it's not sort of these more complex engines. It's a pretty big, simple lump of steel. Yeah. So but all that to say, we've been really happy with this truck for the U.S. especially. This is an amazing vehicle. It can get you there quickly and comfortably and can do it all off-road as well. Yeah. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed all of that. Let us know if you have any questions yeah. about anything that we mentioned. Like we said before, everything that we talked about will be uh, in the description below anything, any products that we mentioned, that sort of thing. Um, if you want to get a cool hat, we have new uh -huh. hats in our store. I'll also link that below. And um, I think that's it. So It's really hot. Watching. We're going to yeah. get inside. <laughs> Thanks for coming along. See you later.